I'm Kate Johnson, founder and lead instructor at the Art of Cheese in beautiful Longmont, Colorado. We specialize in comprehensive, hands-on cheesemaking classes geared toward the home cheesemaker. Of course, not everyone has the time or ability to attend our classes in person, so we've decided to develop these online courses to help spread the cheese love. So, how did I get involved in home cheese making? Well, you could say it all started with a goat named Skittles. In 2005, my family moved to a small five-acre farm near Boulder, Colorado, and not too long after that, my daughters decided to raise dairy goats as a 4-H project and to show them at our county fair. We bought a goofy little Nubian doe, Skittles, and her companion, a Nigerian dwarf weather named Springer. The first spring we had them, Skittles had two kids, Snickers and Milky Way, of course, and once those babies were weaned, I found myself with a steady supply of delicious farm-fresh goat's milk. So naturally, I decided to learn to make cheese. That was just the beginning of what was about to become a life-changing journey for me. You can read more about my cheese-making and goat-keeping adventures and my training and cheese education at my website, theartofcheese.com. I eventually decided to open a cheese making school, which is now located in the Haystack Mountain Cheese Creamery in Longmont, Colorado. I see cheese making as a creative process and an adventure. Sometimes it's easy and other times it's a challenge. The mission of my teaching is to help my students learn from my mistakes. Now on to the cheese. If you're brand new to cheese making, you might be wondering, what is cheese exactly? Well, simply put, Cheese is fermented milk, or milk that has been acidified to the point that the solids in the milk, primarily the proteins, the butter fat, the calcium, and the phosphorus, separate from the liquids. This is known as the curds, the solids, and the whey, the liquid. So how do you get milk to do this? What are the key ingredients? Well, most cheeses have essentially the same four ingredients, milk, culture, rennet, and salt. In some cases, there are simpler cheeses that use other things to acidify the milk, such as lemon juice, vinegar, or citric acid. But the majority of cheeses use these four things as the initial building blocks. The basic science goes something like this. Milk, which is full of lactose, or milk sugars, is warmed to roughly room temperature. The culture is then added, and this is a good bacteria. As this warm temperature, the bacteria wake up and they start consuming the milk sugars, or the lactose, and converting them to lactic acid. In other words, they acidify the milk. Next, we add rennet, an enzyme that coagulates milk, to actually set the curd. We might do very little to the resulting curd, just wait a while and then scoop it into cheesecloth and drain it for a simple soft cheese. Or we might do a number of things like cutting, stirring, heating, and pressing the curd to remove more whey, resulting in a harder, drier cheese. At some point, we will add salt for flavor and preservation. Sounds pretty simple, huh? But how do you get so many different cheeses from these same exact ingredients? Well, in addition to varying the amounts of these ingredients, we'll also vary the time, the temperature, and the techniques we use, and we'll get hundreds of different kinds of cheese. So, as you can see, the process of making cheese from milk involves removing whey from the curd. This can be done through a number of methods, including stirring, heating, evaporation, gravity, pressing, salting, and aging. You'll see how these factors play in the various cheese recipes when you view more courses online. Here's a general rule of thumb. The more whey you remove from the solids, the harder the cheese. Okay, now we know a little bit about the ingredients we'll be using, what about the equipment we'll need? Well, for simple soft cheeses, you'll just need a nice heavy pot, anywhere from a gallon or a half gallon, up to two to three gallons for most home recipes. We'll need a slotted spoon or a skimmer. We'll need a measuring cup. We'll need some small measuring spoons and we'll need a thermometer that will read temperatures between about 70 and 200 degrees in one or two degree increments. It's very nice if it has a clip to clip onto the side of your pot too. 
Then we'll also need some fine woven cheesecloth, also known as butter muslin. Um, and this is a variety that I get from the New England Cheese Making Supply Company that's really nice quality butter muslin. And you'll need a strainer of some kind. Pretty basic, really. Probably mostly things you already have on hand. You'll want to keep everything nice and clean. So to sterilize your equipment before use, you have a few options. You can run it through the dishwasher on the sanitized setting, or you can boil it with some water and, and put your utensils in the boiling water, or you can use a sanitizing solution. Now for more complex cheeses, you'll also need a knife to cut the curd, some kind of a form if you're making a hard pressed cheese, you'll need some kind of a cheese press, and you'll also need some kind of an aging refrigerator. But we'll talk more about those items in a later class. So now let's talk about milk. Before we begin making our first cheese together, let's come back to the main ingredient, milk. Because milk is such a key player in cheese making, it warrants a little more attention and understanding. Now there are four main factors in milk that I'd like to discuss, and those are the species the milk comes from, whether it's farm fresh or store bought, whether it's raw or pasteurized, and whether it's homogenized or not. So first, let's talk about the species. Probably the most common of the three species of milk used for cheese making are cow milk, goat milk, and sheep milk. But cheese can be made from any kind of dairy milk, including water buffalo, donkey milk, mare's milk, and other less commonly thought of mammals. But getting back to the main three, just know that you can make any cheese from any of these milks. For instance, I make goat cheddars, camemberts, blues, and Swiss cheeses all the time because I have easy access to goat's milk. But traditionally, most cheeses are made from one or another kind of milk. And certainly, if you vary the species of milk, you're going to have a little different flavor or texture in your resulting cheese. But most people have easiest access to cow's milk, and it's far more affordable than goat and sheep milk in most markets. So in many cases, that will be your initial milk of choice. So second, where do you get your milk? Obviously, if you can find farm fresh milk, either using milk from your own dairy animal or a locally sourced milk, that is always the best and will give you the opportunity to make your most flavorful cheeses. But don't sweat it if you're just starting out and don't know where to get farm fresh milk. Many grocery store milks will do and may be a more affordable way for you to get started. The most important factor to consider in selecting a grocery store milk is whether or not it's pasteurized and if so, at what temperature. This leads to our third milk concern, raw milk versus pasteurized milk. Now as you know, when milk comes out of the animal, it's raw. But raw milk is regulated differently in, in different states. In some states, you can purchase raw milk at many grocery stores, whereas in other states, it's illegal to buy and sell raw milk in any way. Still, other states, like my own here in Colorado, allow for people to get raw milk through a raw milk CSA, that stands for Community Supported Agriculture, also known as a herd share program. Whether or not you can find raw milk in your area, the question remains, should you use raw milk in your cheese making? Raw milk advocates would say yes, absolutely, while some health department officials would say no, never. So what should you do? Well, first, you should know that the legal requirement for a commercial cheesemaker in the United States is that they can only use raw milk when making a cheese that's going to age for at least 60 days. So the re recommendation is that us home cheesemakers follow those same guidelines. For the purposes of our classes, that's the advice we'll follow. But I would suggest you do some research on your own and become familiar with both the pros and cons of using raw milk. We will discuss changes to your ingredient amounts when using raw milk in our classes that deal with aged cheeses. So for your fresher, less aged cheeses, let's assume you're going to use pasteurized milk. It's important to know that not all pasteurization temperatures are the same. As a general rule of thumb, any milk that has been ultra pasteurized, which happens at temperatures as high as 270 degrees and above, is just too damaged to make cheese. So definitely stay away from those. But there's a wide variety of temperatures used to pasteurize other milks from a low of 145 degrees up to 180 or 190 degrees. In general, the lower the temperature the milk was pasteurized at, the better it will behave for your cheese making. 
You don't always know what temperature your grocery store milks were pasteurized at, but you can do some investigating to find out. Try calling the dairy itself or asking your grocery store dairy manager to help you find out. So the last factor I want to talk about is homogenization. Homogenization is where we mechanically break down the fat molecules really small so they stay suspended in the milk instead of rising to the top. Goat and sheep milk are naturally homogenized. So this is a consideration that applies mostly to cow's milk. The process of homogenization in cow's milk is another factor that damages the milk to some degree. So milks that have had this process won't behave as well as those that haven't. If you can find non-homogenized milks at your grocery store, also known as cream top or cream line milks, like this one here, those are your best bet. You can see this line of cream across the top here. But if you can't find non-homogenized milk, just be sure to stay away from those ultra-pasteurized brands. Okay, are you ready to make some cheese? For our first cheese together, I'm going to make a simple whole milk ricotta. This is by far one of the easiest and quickest cheeses you can make, and it's just so, so much better than the store-bought ricotta. You'll be hooked once you try it. Ricotta itself means recooked, and traditionally it is made with the leftover whey from making some other type of cheese, bringing the whey close to boiling to develop any solids that are still remaining in it. But for us home cheese makers, who are usually making cheese in very small quantities, your yield will be so small with this technique that it's not really worth the effort. So I like to use whole milk instead. You can use 2% if you want lower fat cheese, but you'll also get less cheese. Our ingredients for this version of ricotta will be whole milk, vinegar, salted butter, and baking soda. The last two of these ingredients are optional, but I'll tell you why I add them when we get there. Remember, your recipe is included along with this class, so download it and have that on hand. Okay, so to start with, we're going to use a gallon of whole milk. And I'm going to use Longmont dairy milk because this is a locally produced milk in my part of the world. So we're putting a gallon of milk in this big heavy pot. It's really important with ricotta that you have a heavy double clad bottom if possible because this is going to get really hot and we don't want to scald our milk. So once we have our milk in there and we've got our little cheese thermometer on the side here, we're going to begin heating this milk and we're going to heat it on probably a medium to medium high temperature. We're going to be stirring this milk constantly until we get up to about 185 degrees. So we want to keep stirring so that we don't scald the bottom of the milk and also so that that temperature will keep moving throughout the pot. Okay, so once we get to about 185, we're going to go ahead and add our vinegar. We're using a quarter cup of apple cider vinegar in this case. You can really use any vinegar for this recipe, but I like to use apple cider vinegar because it's a little bit sweet and it just gives a little bit nicer flavor. And as you can see, right away we get some curds developed. But as long as those curds are still floating in what looks like just creamy white milk, we want to keep going a little bit longer. So what I like to do is just keep stirring and heating until I really see a change in how that whey looks. What I'm looking for is for the whey to all of a sudden become kind of yellowish and for the curds to get really obvious. Did you see that? It just made that change. All of a sudden we see that we've got really white curds floating in kind of a yellowish clear way. And that's when we know we've developed all the curds we're going to develop. So I'm going to move this off the heat. But I just want to tell you, if that doesn't happen right away for you at 185, some milks take a little bit longer to develop, don't be tempted to add more vinegar right away. Just go ahead and keep stirring and heating until you see that change happen. If you get as high as 195 or 200 degrees and you still just have white creamy milk, then you might want to add one more teaspoon of vinegar um, and, and wait to see that change. If we add too much vinegar to our milk, we're just going to get kind of chewy and sour curds. But if we don't add enough vinegar, we won't develop all the curds we could develop. So at this point, when I see that clear separation between the curds and the whey, I'm done and I'm ready to 
pull these curds out of the way. So I've got my butter muslin in my um, strainer here, and I'm just going to scoop these curds right out. All right, now the curds that I'm scooping into this strainer are finished ricotta. And you could stop right here. You wouldn't have to add any more ingredients. But I have two more ingredients I like to add. And that is salted butter and a little bit of baking soda. So the reason I like to add salted butter is that I find that that salt just brings up the flavor of our cheese a little bit. And the butter, well, the butter just makes everything better. Just add some creaminess to it, adds a little more flavor. But like I said, it's totally optional. You wouldn't have to add that ingredient. But if you are going to add that ingredient, there's no need to melt your butter ahead of time. Because remember, these curds are about 185 degrees. So what I usually do is just let my, my curds drip for a minute or two. And in fact, you can pick up your cheesecloth here and just move the curds around a little bit so that we can see when it stops dripping and help to facilitate that process a little bit. And if you want a really moist, warm ricotta, don't wait any longer than just a few minutes for it to be done dripping. And then you can just take these curds, and you've got your bowl here with your salted butter ready to go, and you're just going to put those curds right on top of that salted butter. So just like this, and they will take care of melting that butter for you. So you're just going to stir this around until you get all that butter melted. And then the last ingredient we're going to add to this is baking soda. Again, this is optional, but the reason we're going to add baking soda is because baking soda is a base, and bases neutralize acids. And what this is going to do is help keep our curds just a little lighter and fluffier by neutralizing the acid in the curd. All right, so we can just take a little sprinkle of baking soda, about a quarter teaspoon, sprinkle it in there, and mix it in. And voila, you're done. Your ricotta is ready to eat. Now, if you think about store-bought ricotta, you're probably thinking of lasagna. And typically, I think of store-bought ricotta as being kind of bland by itself. And then we put the ricotta into our lasagna, and we mix other cheeses in, and maybe some garlic salt. And then we cover it with sauce, and then it's really good. But this homemade ricotta is, is different. It has such a good flavor all by itself that you might decide to, you could still serve it in your lasagna, but you might decide to just serve it as a, a specialty on its own. For instance, one way I like to serve this is just to have some nice bread and take a, a nice warm heap of, war, of fresh ricotta, and then maybe take a little bit of honey and drizzle the honey right over the top of that. This actually makes a really good breakfast, believe it or not. There you go, mmm, yum. OK, so another option you have, of course, you can use this ricotta in your lasagna. It will be wonderful for that. But instead of using it that way, how about making it the star of your meal? What you can do is take a little layer of pasta and then put some nice sauce on top of that. And then how about putting a nice, warm, heaping spoonful of fresh ricotta on top? And then every bite you take will have this warm, delicious, homemade ricotta on top. You should try and eat this fresh ricotta while it's fresh, because that's when it, it's at its best. But you can keep it in your refrigerator for about 10 days, or you can freeze it until later use. So wasn't that easy and delicious? I hope this introduction to cheese making has been helpful and interesting to you. If we've piqued your curiosity and interest in cheese making, we'd love to invite you to continue on with our other online courses. Or better yet, come to beautiful Longmont, Colorado and take a hands-on class with us. We offer multi-day courses for those who might come from far away, and there are lots of other fun things to do in town while you're here. I've included a flyer about our area that you can download. Please also see the resources document I've provided along with this class and consider watching the other videos in this series. Thanks to our sponsors. These are all companies whose products I use on a regular basis, so I hope you'll consider them when you start making cheese. Enjoy!